Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Future of Connected Cooling live stream. We're so excited that you decided to join us uh, tonight, at least tonight here in Copenhagen. But I know that many of you are joining in from places all over the world. We're broadcasting tonight on four different channels. We're on our LinkedIn channel. We're on Twitter. We're on our global YouTube channel for Danfoss Cooling. And then we're also broadcasting on our Danfoss Cool US channel in the United States. And I'm really excited to have Thomas and Julian with me here today. We're gonna to be sharing about the trend of connected cooling that is going throughout the industry and sharing some really, really exciting technologies and solutions that, uh, that we have in play. And so I wanna kick things off very shortly, but I want to remind you that this is an interactive live stream. We want to not just present, but we wanna have the conversation with you. So if you're tuning in, uh, no matter where you are in the world, please uh, give us a thumbs up when you like what we're talking about, hit that like button. Also be sure to leave us a comment or a question off in the chat. We have chat moderators, they're, uh, they're there to interact with you and they're also passing uh, your questions and comments on to us so that we can address them here, right here in the live stream. So uh, it's really cool to see. I can see that people are tuning in from the US. We've got people tuning in from India, uh, down in Mexico and in Serbia. So it's really great to see all of you joining us here for this live stream, but we wanna get things started. So I'm going to hand things over now to Thomas Kulster, who is going to give us a, a nice kickoff to this, uh, to this topic of connected cooling. Thomas, go ahead. Thank you very much, Lasse, and hi, everybody. I see people tuning in from all over the world. It's truly wonderful to get the opportunity to connect with you. Uh, about this, uh, at least what I believe is a very exciting topic, the future of uh, connected cooling. So uh, what we have today is we're going to talk a little bit about what does it actually mean when we talk about connected cooling, and we're going to focus around what are what is available today, what is coming in the future the way we see it. So we'll try to sort of look into the crystal ball and envision what the future looks like for connected cooling systems. Uh, I do have, as you may be able to see here behind me, a whiteboard that I may or may not use. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but I also do have just uh, one or two slides that I want to kick off with. Uh, so before we dive into uh, connected cooling and all the, the, the nice and cool things that it can do for us, I just want to uh, share with you just one slide because I believe it's easier to show you a slide rather than try to, uh, let's say, recreate that as we uh, uh, as we go along on the whiteboard here. So let's see. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. So just bear with me for a while. So uh, what does it mean when we talk about uh, connected and connected cooling and uh, IoT in particular, Internet of Things, is, is uh, probably a term that, that has been tossed around for quite a few years already. So really simply put, just to get a baseline for everybody, what we're talking about is essentially connecting a device to the Internet. So uh, it means that in order to do so, we need to have sensors inside the device, whether it's a, it's a compressor or it's a full refrigeration system, so sensors that pick up on data. Those sensors will then send the data to the internet. They can either do that directly or through a gateway. We'll not get into the, uh, the technical uh, details in, in this live stream, but just to establish the, the, the baseline. So the data from the sensors goes to the cloud. The cloud then picks up uh, and collects the data, manages, structures the data, and then on top of that, provides a layer to uh, process and visualize the data because uh, simple raw data typically doesn't bring a lot of value. And what this really is all about is the value that connected uh, assets, connected devices, and connected cooling systems can, can really bring to us. So the, the data, as, as I mentioned, is really here to give us actionable insights, to really let us know about the system or the individual component that could be a compressor. How is it uh, performing? Uh, how much energy is it consuming? and so on and so forth. So that's essentially the, uh, the, the whole notion about connecting an asset or connected, uh, uh, connecting a cooling system, providing it the ability to measure how it's operating and send that data uh, to the internet. 
So um, with that in mind, uh, let me just uh, go away from the slide here and back to, uh, to the camera. So uh, as I mentioned, the data that we pick up on can uh, give insights, but it can also trigger automation activities. So uh, data can also uh, initiate other activities that react on, on data being push, pushed by certain devices. We'll get into the, the notion of automation uh, a little bit later. If we look at, the, at, at connectivity in general, some trends and facts uh, and, and some, some key numbers just to get everybody aligned on that because over the, the past years, uh, the, the number of connected devices and, and systems have grown more or less exponentially. So at, at the current date, uh, currently we, we see more than 11 million devices are being connected. So this isn't just cooling devices, that's more in general. 11 million devices go on the internet every day. And today we have roughly about 30 billion devices uh, today. And predictions say that we will get to 75 billion devices. by 2025. So the growth is quite staggering. And the devices, they connect in different means. They connect uh, uh, through the internet, through uh, HTTP, uh, HTTPS, uh, 5G, or through uh, mesh networks that, uh, that you may know from, uh, from home automation if you've ever uh, ventured into that. So there are different ways of, um, of, of connecting. Um, and when we talk about uh, automation, so there, there are different things that, that the, the value of uh, connected devices bring to us. So it can basically automate simple tasks. So uh, that's, that's the first thing, so task automation. So let's take an example from the refrigeration industry. So um, understanding or, or sensing the uh, air temperature in a refrigerated cabinet and putting that up in a report for compliance needs. In Europe, for example, you have uh, HACCP as one of the compliance standards that you use in uh, food service and in, in food retail industries. And uh, automating the process of uh, a net or uh, automatically picking up on the data based on the census and putting that in a decent looking chart rather than manually have to measure temperatures and note down the uh, the temperature on a piece of paper or an Excel sheet will save significant amounts of time. So simple task automation is uh, is definitely one of the uh, one of the trends that are driven by by connected assets. You also can go a little bit further and talk about process automation. So uh, to stay in uh, in the refrigeration industry uh, and stay on the on temperatures, for example, uh, if you have a certain temperature threshold inside a refrigerated cabinet. And the sensor, the temperature sensor, uh, notices that the temperature goes above the threshold, that can trigger a, a process or that can trigger an activity. So like a temperature alarm, that temperature alarm can then trigger an additional process where you dispatch a technician or you send a notification to a system owner or whoever needs to know that the temperature is, um, is above its limit. So those are just two examples of, of the value that, that connected systems uh, bring. But um, I want to go back to the last slide that I want to present uh, today. And it's a example not directly refrigeration related, but still um, the coffee machine here. Because when we talk about uh, the value of, uh, of connectivity, what's important to understand is that connected systems or connected assets can bring value to different stakeholders. So if we take the coffee machine example, if you're the machine operator or the barista, or the, the guy behind the counter, so to speak, in a coffee shop, it's uh, very nice to know if uh, the temperature levels are right, the, the pressure inside the machine is right, uh, you want to know if the, the bean levels are correct or if you need to uh, refill the beans 
or if there's any hygiene needs uh, so you can ensure that the system works and delivers the best possible product, in this case, the best cup of coffee. So for the store owner, there's additional value as well. You can see sales data. You can see exactly at what time you're selling the different uh, types of coffee or the different products. Uh, for the machine manufacturer, you can see uh, sales data and you can see um, certain events that may lead to a system failure. So you can use as an in as input to optimize the different components inside uh, the next generation of coffee machines based on actual data. And for the service technicians that uh, that need to go on site to to maintain and to fix uh, the the assets or the uh, in this case the coffee machine, you can understand before you go on site the current condition that the machine is in. You can maybe through that understand: Do I need to bring certain spare parts, certain tools, um, and what is the service history? So is this, is it the same thing that is constantly breaking down of this coffee machine? So all in all, something that can help you prepare for your visit and therefore improve the, the time it takes to actually uh, fix the issue. So the value uh, as such is, uh, is quite significant for uh, many different stakeholders. So depending on you are, there, there are different values in a connected system. So if we then hover back to cooling, uh, because I, I deliberately took an example here that, that were a little bit outside just to show, show the value, so a little bit outside of cooling. But if we can get back to, to the cooling industry, uh, there are certain trends uh, that we see uh, and, and some of these trends that I would like to, to highlight here before I hand it over. So as I mentioned, uh, connectivity uh, uh, is growing and uh, we just saw the numbers here. Uh, so this means that as connectivity becomes more available, more affordable, there is opportunity, vast opportunity in connecting more assets and measure more data. And uh, what it means in cooling, for example, is that you can, uh, in a pretty uh, straightforward way, actually connect all your different assets. So it means not just the fixed assets, but also the integral assets or the, uh, or the plugins. Uh, that will enable you to really get an end-to-end -end connectivity of all the important assets, whether you are in a food retail store or you are in a, um, a food service operations or, or industrial uh, uh, refrigeration setting like a, a dairy plant or a slaughterhouse. Really, the, the, uh, the, the trend going towards uh, making connectivity more available really means that you can just add more sensors, harvest more data, and therefore improve the insights that, that you get out of a connected system. Uh, another thing that I want to, uh, to highlight is also something that we'll dive into uh, in a little bit later, but the uh, advanced analytics. So data as such, yes, you can use it for, for visualization, visualization purposes and for condition and monitoring, but you can also, uh, by analyzing the data, uh, be able to come towards the state where you can actually predict certain events. So predictive maintenance going from uh, acting when there is a, uh, an issue in the system to actually predicting when there will be an issue in the system so you can fix the problem before it becomes a real issue. Obviously, there's also the energy aspect to it. So reducing energy consumption is certainly something that is uh, that is super relevant uh, as well. So those are just some of the trends that that we're seeing. Uh, so I will, with that, hand it over uh, to uh, to you, Lasse, to uh, take us forward from here. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Uh, that was a really great overview of uh, yeah the potential in uh, in connected cooling and, and some of the uh, the trends that we, that we in Danfoss are are really starting to see. Um, it, it's cool to be able to peer down the road a little bit, but I know that Julian also wants to, to dive into what is uh, actually happening here and now. Uh, but before I go to you, Julian, I just want to, uh, to one, thank all of our viewers. Uh, it's great seeing your comments. Uh, a lot of you are, are posting where you're tuning in from throughout the world, and that's really great to see. But we also want to remind you that this is a, an interactive uh, live stream, that you have the chance to ask questions and get live, uh, get live answers right from our experts here. Uh, Thomas and Julian are both really, really excited to interact with you. So uh, as they're talking, drop in the questions. We won't wait until the end uh, to, to ask them. 
And so, uh, but of course you'll also have a chance at the end of the live stream to ask your questions too. So uh, be posting in the chat. Uh, and of course, make sure to give us a, a, a thumbs up or a like if you are enjoying the conversation and, get, and getting something out of it. So, all right, with that, Julian, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Can you just, uh, yeah, share uh, how we're, we're making this reality today? Absolutely, Lasse. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Uh, yes, as product manager here at uh, Danfoss Cooling, uh, as Lasse said, it's uh, especially my job to make sure that the potential that Thomas was talking about actually uh, comes to reality. Uh, so, uh, like Thomas, I've also uh, I've actually just got one slide that I would uh, actually like to share with you. Uh, and I think this slide will help uh, basically uh, frame the discussions that we can take for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, so, Lasse, just confirm you can see that for me. Yep, we're good to go. Fantastic, great. Uh, so I also appreciate that some of you may just be in listening mode here. You may be driving or walking home or... Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll do my best to, to basically provide a good uh, voiceover for you for, for what everybody else is looking at right now on the screen. Uh, so the slide I'm actually showing just has uh, very quite simple, has three levels. Uh, first level being uh, the applications. So what I want to talk a little bit about uh, is the whole challenge of connectivity. Uh, as Thomas mentioned, an awful lot of the potential here is in the value of the data. Uh, but let's not ignore the fact that actually collecting this data, uh, understanding what data points add the most value, uh, and then later on, what can we do with them? So it's really a full end-to-end -end process here that we need to understand. Uh, so let me uh, hold your hand and take you a little bit through this journey for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, so on this applications layer, I mean, uh, all of us uh, on this call are clearly uh, interested in the whole uh, industry of cooling. Uh, so we all appreciate that there can be very complex uh, cooling systems, uh, those that take uh, a large uh, quantity of different types of assets. Uh, and this really is what this slide is doing for us. Is it's uh, showing us that depending on what it is, so it may be a compressor pack. Uh, so clearly we have a compressor asset or a number of compressor assets within this pack, the heart of the refrigeration system. And then on top of those, we have a full array of uh, pressure sensors. There can be valves, um, there can be uh, thermostatic valves coming in here as we start pulling in HVAC uh, systems on top of our cooling uh, infrastructure, gives us uh, heat exchanger assets, and obviously the ability then to generate uh, and benefit from the, benef for the benefits of heat recovery systems. So what all this basically means is that uh, we have all of these assets with the potential of generating an awful lot of data points. And these data points are managed by what could be actually a cocktail of controllers. There could be different asset manufacturers, therefore with different controllers in this whole infrastructure. So before we even get to generate uh, or realizing the value from these, uh, we then need to make sure, first of all, how do we connect these assets before we can start pushing this into the cloud? So this is where our, our second layer comes in. So I'm calling this our connectivity layer. Uh, so typically the more complex uh, refrigeration systems are the ones that we would uh, usually find in our supermarkets. Uh, most of the assets that I've just mentioned, they would be connected uh, in a network. Uh, that network would then be connected and controlled by a central unit. So in this case, on the right-hand side here, an uh, example of our system manager range, uh, where we have this asset uh, centrally in the store. It's collecting all of these data points from refrigeration systems, from uh, HVAC systems, from lighting systems, uh, and managing uh, uh, basically all of the controls of that uh, for optimum use. However, it's not always the case that we find that we have, uh, we have these sophisticated networks in place. Uh, many applications whereby uh, some assets aren't networked at all. Uh, so these could be uh, things like connected cold rooms or standalone cold rooms uh, that again are cooling a large volume of, uh, of merchandise. Uh, they need to be connected to the cl cloud, uh, not only for food safety, but also for diagnostics. Uh, we're also seeing now uh, a large demand for 
click and collect refrigerated lockers. So those that you would see locally in your towns, they could be next to petrol stations or somewhere within the retail environment. Uh, so again, you order your uh, groceries online, you pick them up on the way home from, uh, from one of these refrigerated lockers. So again, exactly the same type of requirement. Uh, so we need to connect these and we need to be able to remotely manage uh, these assets. Hey, uh, um, Julian, uh, if you don't yep. mind me jumping in here, I think we've got yeah, a sure. relevant question uh, at this point. And uh, I want to throw it out there and I hope I get this name <laughs> right. But Clodian is asking, how is 5G going to change the way that we connect HVAC devices? Well, I think, uh, again, very good question. So we're, all, we're always looking at, uh, at these uh, advances in telecommunication technology, which is out there. Uh, I mean, a number of these uh, devices, so they're actually timing is perfect, the one I'm on right now. Uh, so here we are looking at a, a range of devices that we have, uh, we call the brand name Prosa. Uh, and these are developed really for that type of environment. So if we want uh, a connectivity via a uh, cellular network, for example, using uh, SIM card uh, telemetry. Uh, that's exactly the type of asset uh, that we would actually utilize in that type of environment. So whether it's 3G, 4G, 5G technology, uh, obviously we're, we're keeping abreast as, as best we can uh, with the technology and make sure we have the right level of connectivity for that asset. And, and if I may just jump in and, and add to that, uh, Julian, because obviously uh, 5G with, with uh, the, the obvious benefits of, of 5G uh, speed and, and in particular the very low latency of, of 5G, I think it's, it's, it's below 20 milliseconds, oh, obviously opens up for uh, new applications, uh, especially uh, business critical uh, solutions or, or business critical applications. Uh, so. Uh, edge computing, which means the, the um, uh, automation processes uh, that are time critical uh, will be able to be to be conducted uh, through 5G, which was maybe in, in older generation uh, networks not uh, not uh, not so um, so feasible due to latency and, and speeds and so on. So that's one of the things that that the new 5G, uh, as, as, as I see it, uh, uh, brings in terms of, of opportunity and, and new new opportunities in refrigeration. Thanks, Thomas, and uh, again, thanks for the questions. Um, also, as you just move along a little bit here, also um, uh, introduce the concept here of other individual type assets. Uh, so again, what we see a lot of in our work within, particularly the food retail type environment, is where we have uh, retail facilities that have actually quite a lot of uh, integral uh, refrigerated cabinets or plug-in cabinets, some of you may uh, know them as. Uh, so these are cabinets which aren't connected to a network. Typically they could be promotional cabinets. So uh, a retailer is given these by a food manufacturer, so it's branded. Uh, it's used uh, as a promotional cabinet near the, the checkout counter, for example. Um, again, uh, depending on what the merchandise is, uh, there is certainly a requirement here to make sure primarily that these, uh, the food, uh, the contents of these cabinets are stored at the right temperature for food safety. Uh, but again, if these are alarming assets, then uh, these alarms need to be captured. So therefore, they also need to be connected. Uh, so again, uh, a portfolio of those we're starting to see an increased demand for. And then on the left-hand side, um, uh, I talked a little bit about uh, the components uh, on the on layer on level one here on this particular chart. Uh, but what we see is, you know, it's not always that you will have uh, same manufacturers of assets with any facility. There can be different assets coming in. There could be different manufacturers. Therefore, we have different control uh, uh, infrastructure across these facilities. But again, from a, from a retailer point of view, their ideal scenario is to actually have uh, one platform that can collect and manage all of this data. Uh, so again, that is where these, uh, these types of universal gateways come in. Uh, so we also have those within our Alsense portfolio. Uh, therefore, depending on what the underlying assets are and how, uh, if you like, how old the assets are in terms of legacy, uh, it gives us the opportunity to collect 
certain amount of data from these assets and also where we can and where we're legally allowed to is, is integrate uh, with third party assets. Got another really relevant question, I think, then for you, here, Julian. So this is from John, and he's asking uh, what hosting provider is being used for AdSense? Uh, so, so how are we in, enabling this technology? Okay, good uh, question, John. That takes me nicely here into the uh, uh, the value layer, as I call it. So this is the whole monitoring and management. So we have all of this data. And you can see right in the center, John, that we have that cloud that we call the AdSense cloud. Uh, and AlSense is, uh, is a uh, digital services platform that uh, we launched uh, back in October, um, which is uh, a refresh or a complete redevelopment, actually, of our previous uh, services or platform. Uh, so this now is right at the forefront of the technology. Uh, John, to answer your question, it's uh, Microsoft Azure is the, uh, uh, is the underlying uh, architecture that we're using uh, for this platform. And then what we're doing with that is then we are able to develop a whole portfolio of both digital and also managed services. Uh, so if I take a few minutes, let me just uh, give you a few examples here. So we've collected uh, all of this data from all these different uh, components and applications coming through our connectivity devices, push them up into the AlSense cloud. And then just working from, uh, from left to right, let me just give you a few examples here of, uh, of typically what we're doing. Uh, so you can see there uh, from a re remote management point of view, uh, clearly we all have uh, smartphones now. We're all very familiar with apps. Uh, you know, we're always on, we're always connected. Uh, this is exactly the same in our working lives as it is, as it is our personal lives. Uh, so again, the type of uh, functionality that we're building in now to these devices can certainly support the likes of our, our contractor or, or our service provider customers. Those that would prefer to receive alarms, for example, on their, on their apps, on their phones, uh, do a level of diagno uh, diagnostics in there. Uh, prior to going to store, so they're not basically wasting valuable time heading to store only to find out that a particular issue could have res been resolved remotely. Uh, so we have uh, activities going on in that area to push a lot of the, uh, uh, the basic level of functionality where it makes sense into the hands uh, of an app. Uh, we also have um, uh, managed services, so again, within Danfoss, but also supporting our service providers. Uh, we have a number of 24-7 monitoring uh, centers, so we can collect uh, all of these uh, alarms and issues that are coming from, from these stores. Uh, we can do different levels of services, so therefore we can triage them. So again, that's in a case we're prioritizing them based on the severity of the issue. Uh, also having some uh, what I call expert interaction services. So if you're perhaps a service provider that needs some additional assistance in understanding, uh, let's say, some of the Danfoss technology that uh, could be in those stores, then again, we can connect you through to, to the right people within our, our teams that can provide some uh, high-level insight and advice in terms of how you operate uh, some of these assets. Uh, next along here is uh, predictive analytics. Uh, the predictive analytics and predictive maintenance has been a topic which is nothing new. It's been around for, for a long time. Uh, but now with the new technology that we have available, uh, again, with the, with the Microsoft uh, partnership that we have, uh, this has given us the opportunity really to uh, uh, press our foot on the gas, uh, the accelerator, and actually move, move aggressively into this area. Uh, so we're working very hard in here, and uh, you'll hear an awful lot more in the coming weeks, actually, about uh, some of the, uh, the new launches that we're going to do in this area. Uh, one of the particular interesting areas would be a complete refrigeration optimization system. Uh, so this being something whereby we can score uh, the, the operation of a particular refrigeration system. Uh, but also adding additional value, and that is what are the recommendations that we are making digitally uh, that if they were implemented, uh, they would make sure you had a far more efficient solution. And obviously that will be re reflected uh, in your overall score. So a little bit more on that uh, in the coming weeks. Hey, uh, Julian, I'm gonna jump in yep. here with another great question. Um, this one is from Samuel. 
And he's asking, is this solution only working for Danfoss products? Uh, again, great, uh, great question, Samuel. Um, obviously, our, our first, our initial minimal viable product uh, that we launched back in October was uh, was focused initially on the Danfoss uh, products and the install base that we have. Uh, however, as I mentioned uh, on level two here, where we have uh, third party devices, uh, in effect, what this enables us to do is also take uh, data from non Danfoss devices. Uh, we can pull that through, we can then ingest that data uh, and also make that data uh, available inside the Alsense cloud. So, so in effect, I could be looking at a cockpit uh, of different dashboards, uh, whether they be alarms or some information about uh, specific asset performance. Uh, and we can handle that data the same way as if it was coming from a Danfoss uh, asset or whether it was coming from a third party asset. Good question. Okay, if we just jump onto the right hand side. Um, so again, some of the uh, the other value added uh, benefits that we will get from data, and that can be looking at specific assets. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the heart of the whole refrigeration system, as we all know, is the compressor. Uh, so very important that we keep, uh, keep our eye on the performance of the compressor. We collect all the relevant data points that we can. Uh, so again, what we're doing, we haven't launched it yet, but we have a uh, Compressor Insights uh, tool. So again, specifically for that, looking at, uh, for example, suction pressure of our compressor packs, looking at the run times, doing some correlations of different data points. Uh, what that will lead us to is, again, on the whole uh, predictive maintenance uh, topic, uh, ideally preventing issues happening, uh, by predicting, uh, okay, there may potentially be an issue in three months' time uh, with this particular asset uh, based on the data that we're collecting. So therefore, we can advise a service provider that rather than waiting for a routine maintenance, you need to now go and act uh, and do the uh, pay attention to the actual compressor before, for example, the ambient temperature rises, and then that will put more pressure on that particular asset. Uh, energy efficiency is something Thomas touched on uh, in his introduction here. We've, uh, we've always been focused at Danfoss on uh, making sure not only from a hardware point of view that we give you the best possible energy efficient components, uh, but also in the cloud, uh, an awful lot that we can actually do to make sense of that data. Uh, so a number of these things for you. First of all, we have to uh, be able to measure. Uh, so that means we, uh, we need to be able to collect the right energy uh, consumption variables from across the, the, the assets and the entire estate. So we have a, a portfolio of wireless energy sensors, very easily installable, uh, that we can plug in and then we can transmit that data uh, from the device, either through one of our gateways that you see in the middle connectivity layer here, uh, or again, based on uh, the question we had before, uh, this could be going via uh, three to five G uh, cellular networks into the cloud, and then we can uh, we can manage the data that way. And in terms of managing that data, yes, uh, things like uh, energy uh, energy dashboards are available, uh, but also we're working further in terms of building or enabling you to build very accurate energy models. So what I mean by that is all the influencing variables uh, which play a part in determining what the consumption is. So not only ambient temperature, but we can also look at size of the store and store occupancy levels, for example. Uh, and then once we have that baseline measure, we can then use that for forecasting purposes. So then you can start to predict what is your consumption going to be under different scenarios within three, four, five, six months time from now. Uh, so again, very good insight uh, to enable you not only to manage your carbon emissions, but also man manage uh, the whole uh, energy cost center. Okay, finally, let me give you a slightly different example of, of also what we're doing with uh, some of this cooling data. And that is how can we use it for sales and marketing insight. So let me tie in a, an example that uh, I mentioned before. So let's say we have uh, we have an individual asset. So we have uh, you know we have assets now which are installed, for example, in uh, they could be shopping malls, they could be cinema complexes. Uh, and typically, uh, what some of these assets can do for us 
is if it is a uh, drinks dispensing unit, for example. It's in a cinema complex. Uh, we can actually monitor the flow rates of the dispensing of different soft drinks in this unit. So you may think, okay, there's nothing too clever there. Uh, but also if you start connecting the dots here and tying it together, if you're a manager of a, a cinema complex, there is a certain movie playing right now. The demographics uh, of, the, uh, of the audience are teenagers, very cal calorie conscious. Therefore, what they're starting to see then is they're dispensing more of the uh, low calorie soft drinks during certain periods of time during the week when that demographic is present. So again, they can start using that not only for planning stock levels to make sure that the concentrate in these, uh, these dispensing machines is at the right level, depending on what the demand is, uh, but also they can use that for, for also sales data, uh, for predicting that, okay, next Friday when the movie's showing at this time, uh, typically this is the type of uh, consumption and the type of profit margins that they're starting to see uh, around certain brands of that soft drink. Can I jump in here with a, a question, uh, sure. Julian? Uh, so uh, our good friend over at the Engineering Mindset uh, is uh, here on the live stream and he just asked a question. Uh, so I want to read that one. Uh, could we potentially log what inner components a service technician has worked on or replaced as well as when this occurred? I'm thinking auto reports for clients to free up time. Yeah, uh, uh, certainly what uh, what we're looking. I mentioned before about the uh, the announcement that we'll make in a, in a couple of weeks around uh, the whole refrigeration optimization system. So clearly, if you like, the first step in that process uh, is obviously making sure that you have, uh, if you like, an inventory list uh, within the application. So we're not just saying. You know, you, these are some of the recommendations that we're making because the credibility of recommendations, uh, okay, could be, uh, will certainly be impacted if those recommendations aren't specific to the actual assets that are uh, involved in the store. Uh, so yes, based on that, we will be able then to track exactly uh, what is installed. And then also we can build from there in terms of building uh, the maintenance logs uh, of when uh, when these things were repaired, who did them, when they did them, when new new items were installed. Uh, so we're starting now to see the full uh, the full inventory uh, of everything on my slide here, everything that's in at level one, right up to what we're doing with it at level three. And if I can uh, jump in and, and add to what uh, what Julian is saying, it's it's definitely the direction that we're that we're heading. Uh, as well, and, and one of the more tangible things that, that we're focusing on the moment is, is more refrigerant and, and refrigerant uh, locks, etc., allowing you to track when a, a system has been uh, topped off with a refrigerant, uh, both for the, for the logging aspect, but also because it can provide additional insights or, or access as additional data to provide more actionable insights to determine the, uh, the the current state and and the potential future state of the system, if we know when refrigerant has been uh, has been topped up in the system. Okay, Thomas. I think uh, given the time, I can uh, uh, hand back to you. Okay, uh, just up. just before we uh, we we you take up the torch, Thomas. I just want to again thank our audience uh, for. All the great questions we see, uh, we have some more queued up, but I wanna hand it over to Thomas so that he can make sure to mention a few things and then we'll address a few questions uh, as we get to the, the end of our live stream today. So Thomas, why don't you go ahead and, and share uh, what you wanted to share now? All right, well, uh, I think we're getting to the point where it makes sense to wrap, wrap everything up. So we, we started out by, by looking at some of the trends in the industry and, and we spoke about what, what values uh, drivers that that are being uh, that we consider uh, as as uh, coming out of the trends in in connectivity and and so forth. Um, so I want to wrap up a little bit, uh, just just uh, maybe recapping a little bit and and looking a little bit uh, into the into the future and and try to focus on the uh, some of the the highlights that we see in in connected cooling. So allow me to to use my my whiteboard here for a second. So. Um, if we just look at, uh, at sort of recapping what I said, so we, we say that data brings insights. 
And what we're ideally seeing as, as a trend for the future is not just tell what's going on, but actually tell uh, what's going on or what will be going on and what can you do about it. Um, so if you add another source of input rather than, the, than just the data and you can consider that, sor uh, that source uh, domain expertise, That triggers the way we see it, the ability to do more actionable insights. So data brings insights, but if you if you add domain expertise to interpret what the data is actually saying, you get much further towards actionable insights and ideally predictive insights as well. If you then on top of that add um, automation procedures, and potentially also uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning components, you get uh, uh, well above uh, or beyond that, then you get not just actionable insights, but you also get the opportunity to uh, start automation processes. Um, because that means that we will get towards a scenario, again, if we, if we sort of look into the crystal ball and try to predict what's coming in the future, then, um, then we're really essentially looking at a system that, that uh, potentially could be optimizing itself. So uh, in other words, the orchestra uh, playing, itself, uh, playing itself without uh, the need of a conductor. So the more domain expertise, the more uh, automation and, and, and rule engines uh, supported by artificial intelligence and machine learning will allow us to get us towards a state where the system can either optimize itself or at least propose optimization, optimization uh, enhancement. So uh, adjusting set points or proposing set points to be adjusted based on the, the vast amount of data that we interpret. And also based on set point adjustments, you uh, can enable a feedback loop that allows the system to learn or the machine to actually learn what is the impact of uh, set point changes in the refrigeration system. So if we adjust a set point over there, how does that impact the compressor uh, performance? How does that in impact uh, energy consumption and so on and so forth? So there are really a lot of different uh, opportunities and values to, to really go from just data and, and, and insights that are by default perhaps a bit uh, reactive to go to more to more proactive and, and actionable state for the system where ideally we believe that we will get closer and closer towards a scenario where the system could do its own maintenance or at least propose its own uh, maintenance uh, and thereby eliminate to a certain expect uh, uh, the human factor in, in some areas. We still believe we do need uh, humans to maintain and support refrigeration systems, by the way. I just want to throw <laughs> that in there. We're not trying to eliminate uh, uh, service technicians and engineers, not at all. But there are certain processes that uh, can be automated and, and or where at least the system can support the decision making uh, for, the, uh, for the technicians. Thomas, so, I think, uh, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure thing. Yeah, just I, I, I noticed there's a question uh, in, in, uh, on YouTube from Steven and uh, he asked, uh, are we actually gonna see all sense? And I just think that's a really good setup to, to share like where people can, uh, can find more uh, information about AllSense and, and maybe see it in action. Yes, um, and, and maybe uh, maybe Julian can also uh, jump in here. Uh, we uh, we do have uh, we don't have a publicly available demo uh, as of yet, uh, but we might we might have that in the future. But there's much more uh, to see. So we have a uh, I think we can post a link to our website where you can learn more uh, about uh, AllSense and you can. Uh, you can download uh, some uh, uh, some more facts and details about the about the system. We have lots of information on on the website, uh, and perhaps maybe that's an idea for a future live stream that we do a an introduction to uh, to the system. I want a quick mention. We have uh, an animated infographic right that shows how it all comes together, and then there's also a great video available on our YouTube channel 
where you can see our monitoring center in, in Baltimore and see a little bit of how uh, AllSense brings uh, all this great uh, information together. Just on the, on the back of that, guys, uh, Stephen's question. I know we're doing some uh, regional live streams. I know this one is a global one right now. Mm. Uh, but we have, uh, depending on uh, your region, Stephen, we will uh, be doing some reg regional live streams, I think uh, one or two even next week, but certainly in January, uh, around the globe. And they will be more focused on Alsense. Uh, so I would expect in those sessions we will be showing some, uh, some live Alsense uh, footage. But, uh, as Thomas said, by all means, get in touch directly with us and then uh, we can arrange a session for you. Great. Thomas, I want to make sure I give you a chance to, to finish uh, your wrap up and then uh, maybe we'll have a little time for a few more questions. Absolutely. But let's let's keep the uh, the questions flowing. I think that's a great idea. But but I can just at least finish up what I what I had started here. Um, so uh, the, the, taking the transition, so if we try to try, try to wrap up in, in, in maybe three main highlights, uh, the way we see it, there's certainly more, but uh, in the interest of time, let's, let's try to condense it into three highlights. So the, the first being, as I, as I explained, going from uh, reacting to alarms, uh, so more reactive maintenance, you can call it, to, to proactive maintenance. Uh, predicting uh, maintenance need, uh, predicting uh, potential leaks in the system, etc., and potentially even get to the point where the uh, the system can uh, perform self-diagnosis, uh, making it uh, it easier and faster to to do repairs. Uh, the other thing that I want to touch on, and there were some questions related to that, is um, a, a platform like like Elson's. Uh, do we uh, do we keep it completely self-contained? Absolutely not. Uh, I think uh, for uh, a good uh, IoT platform or, or cloud solution, you need to be able to offer integration opportunities and not, and not build a, a proprietary uh, setup. So obviously, the, the, the second highlight that I just want to bring forward here is the, the vertical integration. So what we have with Elsense is an example of, of a tool that can help you uh, optimize your your food retail stores and uh, and we also have uh, solutions into food service and food and beverage but in other cases it's uh, it for for larger companies it would be one IT system out of many so being able to integrate is something that that is very important uh, for for any IoT system the way i see it and and definitely also the same thing goes for for our system Elston. so integration into work order management systems i, I touched on it in the beginning uh, so when you uh, see uh, when the system detects an alarm uh, and the alarm is diagnosed and there is a need to call a a technician then why not uh, trigger that in a work order management system if that's already set up? So again, automating processes that are typically manual, so removing the, the manual aspect of that. So that's the second one. And then the third one I want to just mention real quick is commissioning. That's another part where uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's relevant uh, to, uh, to, let's say, or there are obvious improvement areas uh, setting up uh, the system or retrofitting a, a controller, uh, making it much easier to just uh, copy settings of one controller over to, uh, to another. That's another, uh, let's say, highlight or trend that I, that I see uh, that, that will be a, a, a big focus on for the future. Very cool. All right, we're, we're getting to near the end of our live stream here, but I wanna just throw out a few more questions for the two of you to answer. And uh, the first one that I have here is from Rasmus. And he asked the question, how do you see connected cooling as an integral part of the smart energy grid, utilizing more fossil-free energy resources and energy flexibility? I can uh, take a first stab at that one, Thomas. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Rasmus, uh, thinking absolutely the right way. Uh, I can say that we're, we're also on that journey. We have. Uh, been providing a number of services in that area for quite some time. I mean, things such as demand response uh, activities that we see uh, a lot of in, in our supermarkets. Uh, so that is something we can, uh, we can offer today. Uh, we're also uh, within our platform able to uh, manage, for example, some renewable energy sources. So uh, uh, solar PV, for example, if that is uh, installed in the, in the supermarket environment. And again, collecting that data 
being able to visualize and show exactly the retailer, what are they consuming from the grid and also potentially what are they selling back to the grid. So that, uh, that's also uh, an area that we're focused on. Uh, and also expanding into more of the smart energy areas. So we uh, interacting in the grid. We're not, we're not quite there yet in our sense, but something which is in our, uh, our roadmap on the energy side is certainly getting into areas such as peak load shedding, uh, pre-cooling uh, uh, of refrigerated assets uh, to make sure they fit within um, uh, the grid uh, constraints. Uh, so these are all areas we're either doing actively right now or we will certainly be offering functionality in the LSense uh, cloud platform to make sure we deliver on those. And, and I think it's almost a, a completely separate live stream uh, <laughs> because we could easily dive into this because it's a very exciting topic especially if we consider the, the, the sustainability aspect of, of the question, right? So getting away from, from uh, fossil fuels. Um, so Julian mentioned the solar PVs as, as one example. You also have uh, uh, energy storage, so battery storage as, as one example. Um, so there, there's so many opportunities and, and by tapping into uh, sustainable energy sources and in the same time intelligently managing the load that you have in your uh, in your in your system, whether it's in a in a in a retail store or it's a um, uh, in an industrial uh, setting like a dairy plant or or a brewery, uh, there are so many opportunities in optimize and uh, postpone or delay certain energy consumers that do not necessarily need to happen if you don't have uh, sustainable energy sources to power that. Uh, so there's so much uh, we can do, but as I said, it's probably a completely separate uh, uh, live stream that I'll be very interested in uh, in taking. That's so great. Uh, we've gone a, a way longer than we original inten originally intended, but that's also okay because there was so much uh, great information that the two of you had to share. And then all of you out in the chat who, uh, with your questions and your comments, it's been so Awesome interacting with all of you and, and being able to address uh, what you're curious about live here on this live stream. So uh, we're gonna wrap things up for today, but that doesn't mean that the questions have to stop. Uh, continue to, uh, to drop them into the comments section of whatever platform you're on. And uh, we'll be watching that and we can even respond uh, after this live stream is over uh, in the coming hours and even in the coming days. So uh, we are very active on all of our social media channels. We try to connect our experts here at Danfoss directly with you. So don't, uh, don't be shy, ask your questions uh, online. And of course, as uh, Julian mentioned, there are more live streams to come. So, but for now, if you wanna stay plugged in, uh, we've got a link that our chat moderators will share uh, where you can get connected to uh, our newsletter and get, stay always up to date on all the latest news, not only about AllSense, but about a lot of the different solutions and technologies that we offer here at Danfoss. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on LinkedIn and on Twitter and on Instagram. We share a lot of great uh, and exciting uh, different materials and insights. Uh, so it's gonna be a, a great time to, to stay connected with us. But we're just so glad that you joined us for this live stream. And I wanna thank both Thomas and Julian, you guys, uh, thanks for coming on uh, here and sharing uh, everything that you have to say about connected cooling and about all sense. Thank, no thank, thank you, Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. All right. With that, we'll sign off for the day.